Hi everyone, it's John from What Up, and welcome back to another video. Now this is my episode two Easter eggs video. We're gonna go through certain elements of the episode and talk about them. Uh, little things that maybe you missed during the first watch of it, or the second, or the third. Some things took me three times to watch it to, to catch on to them. Uh, and we're gonna talk about them in this video. So if you don't know what I do here, or you're new to the channel, I basically cover Wheel of Time show news, and I do a bunch of different videos for each episode of the show that drops. So if you like the Wheel of Time, if you like what Sony and Amazon are doing, Make sure you subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, because there's going to be an absolute ton of content for me between now and Christmas when the show finale airs. Basically, it airs on December 24th, which is, that's, wow. I can't believe we're going to be seeing episode 8 on Christmas Eve. So there you go. All right, uh, before we actually get into the episode, spoiler warning. In this video, I'm going to talk about a bunch of elements of episode 2 of Sony and Amazon's Wheel of Time series. So if you want nothing from that episode or episode 1 ruined for you, well, maybe this isn't the video for you. I'm also going to give a blanket spoiler warning up to and including A Memory of Light. That's the last book in Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series, mainly because I may talk about certain elements that happen throughout the entire book series, and I want to give a blanket warning. So if you're not an avid reader, if you haven't read the series yet, be forewarned, I may ruin some things that you'll only know if you've read the entire series. All right, all of that being said, let's get on to the video. All right, yeah, we're going to start with this. <laughs> Brutal, gross, horrifying, whatever you want to call it. It was certainly very visually stunning. This is where you see the yellow sister tied to the stake and burned to death by Iman Valda, one of the questioners from the White Cloaks. Um, and she has no hands. So I've covered this in a couple of my other videos, but how can this happen? Um, these are little nods to the fans here. Um, a non-book reader seeing this scene may think, how come she couldn't use the one power? Um, for us book readers, though, uh, most of us uh, kind of got to the point during the book series, depending how far you've read, of course, where you found out that when Aes Sedai use the one power, um, they're trained to do weaves a certain way. So to throw a fireball, you have to always do it the same way you've learned. If that includes hand movements or body gestures, guess what? If you can't use those hand movements or body gestures, you cannot use that weave. I think the show is going to extrapolate on that quite a bit. Because we see in the first episode Moraine spinning around. There's a lot of a lot of movement, a ton of movement, more than I would have expected, even reading the series so many times as I did, when she was fighting the Trollocs, weaving air, throwing fireballs, things like that. Um, so, if the White Cloaks were able to surprise this Aes Sedai, basically somehow, I don't know how, they're able to surprise her, and they're able to chop off her hands, that probably gets rid of most of the weaves that she can do. That's one thing. However, not all weaves are learned with movements. Not all of them. Um, some might be learned without movement. And he has seven rings on his belt. This is the seventh ring he's putting on his belt. So, pulls the ring off her chopped off hands, and then he sticks it on his belt. Um, so I think, and this is just a guess, but I think we're going to see Fork Group T introduced way earlier in the series than we would expect. We don't see that till much later in the book series, and basically, if you haven't read that far and you're watching this video anyway, Fork Group T is a drink that basically impedes a channeler's ability to channel. It makes them sleepy, makes them drowsy, makes them unable to touch the true source in any way, shape, or form. If they drink enough of it, they pass out. Um... And you see it later on being used by people to kidnap Aes Sedai or kidnap, I think Nynaeve gets dosed with it a few times. They use it on uh, the Forsaken at one point. It's a really useful tool, not widely known, but used. I'm thinking maybe they're doing this. I'm thinking somehow they're doing this at all. Because this is a yellow sister. Does she have a warder? She can have one. She's not a red, but maybe she didn't. Uh, maybe they already killed the warder and she's suffering the effects of that. Um, Maybe they dosed her with four root tea, and that made her docile enough or unable to channel enough that they can get rid of her hands so they can strap her up to a stake and burn her. I don't know. These are the questions I have about this particular scene anyway. Let me know your thoughts down below in the description, uh, or in the description box, in the comments. Uh, I want to know how you think they caught the Aes Sedai. Personally, I think one of two things. Either the, the hand gestures are going to be a big thing and they can subdue them somehow by tying them up or bonking them over the head, so to speak, uh, before they notice and then chopping their hands off so they can't use the one power or they dose them with fork root. One or the other, or maybe a combination of both. Let me know what you think down below. Um, yeah, and I, I have to include this here because that is just... Visually, probably one of the most impressive things I've seen from the show so far is this particular scene. 
All right, now we're going to talk about this. This is when they are coming to Terran Ferry. Now, in the books, Terran Ferry is a big town. They run through the big town. There is a lot of uh, partying going on. It says bell time. They're having a good time. They hear all that. The Drehar car goes overhead, screeches. Everybody quiets down for a second, and they come back up. This is all prefaced by Matt basically saying, and the, and the rest of them pretty much agreeing, and they're all talking about going into the inn, having some food. It's not quite as good as the wine spring, but they think their journey's over. None of that's in the show. But if you look very closely in the background, you can see lights of a town. So they are showing the town there. Now, I don't know if it was a cut scene of them going through the town or not. They decided to put it in front of it. But basically, they go right to this Master Hightower's hut. Um, I assume his family's inside. Then they get on the ferry from that point. Um, but a few differences from the books. But I think that's Terran Ferry in behind them there. All right, I want to talk about this. Uh, in the book series, Rand uses the one power for the very first time to make sure Bella isn't tired, and Maureen kind of comments on it a little bit. It's a little bit of foreshadowing. Here, we only have one horse that we see her use the one power on. It's implied she used one power on the rest of the horses prior to, um, but we really only see her using the one power to, you know, perk one of them up off the ground so they stand up so they're not so tired anymore. And this is to set up the fact that she's using the power to keep everyone strong and, and going and not herself. Um, so for us, I think this is a small nod, and I, I might be a bit of a stretch here, but I think it's a small nod to that scene in the books where she goes to wash the fatigue from all the horses, but she doesn't really have to with Bella. Um, I would have loved to have seen that included here. It wasn't, but I think this was a small nod to that because she's still doing it to the horses. All right, this I want to talk about this. So... Uh, Rand is asleep inside the ruins, and then Moraine comes and grabs Egwene, and she goes out and she has to talk about the One Power. Now, this is sort of the same as the book series where um, Rand gets up, goes over, eavesdrops on the entire conversation, and then sneaks away at the end and goes back to his bedroll. So he hears the entire conversation with Moraine and Egwene, knows that Moraine is talking about uh, the One Power with Egwene and how she can use it. But he teleports in the show so he was inside the ruins and now he's outside the ruins so i think that scene was probably there i pretty much think 100 percent they probably included the scene where he crept up and he listened to them and it was a way of showing that he knows what's going on um and you know he knows that Egwene is thinking about going to the one uh, to the white tower and becoming an eye said i early uh which we knew in the book series it was cut though i believe because I mean, why would they teleport him outside? And his explanation was, well, I wanted to get to sleep alone and sends her away. Mm, I don't know. But I think, I truly think that uh, that scene was there. And that's that's what I noticed from there. Now we're talking about this, the bats. I believe this is a nod to that dream that the boys had where the rats had their back snapped by the Dark One in their dream, uh, in the inn. They're not in the inn. They're not going to be there. So I think this here is going to be more of... Uh, a replacement for that because matt talks about the bats next being snapped um ran coughs up a bat which is brutal i loved it i super loved seeing that scene very cool but i think this was a small nod to us because they didn't include that dream word for word but kind of the same next thing i want to talk about is this this is for lack of a better term the dark one although for those who read the series we know it's a shamael um, we know that his hollowed eyes with the fire and his burned skin and stuff are all from using the true power Far too much. Um, it's the last stages of true power sickness before, before you basically draw too much of it and die because you're so addicted to it. Um, but the boys all think he's the dark one. So this is our first shot of him. Now there are a number of scenes with him in it um, going forward, I would assume. But there are a couple in the third uh, episode for sure when I get to my Easter eggs there that are they're very brief. They're just... If you, if you didn't quite see it very fast, you'd miss it. But I want to showcase him here because when we get to my episode 3 Easter egg video, you're going to see him but very briefly. And it's probably going to take some doing to get that frame in the screenshot, but I'm going to try. All right. This here, uh, she gives up a ring, gives it to Lan. This is a nod to her being Mistress Alyss as far as I'm concerned because she's pretending to be someone she's not. It's showing that I said I can't lie, but they can bend and stretch the truth and make it dance, so to speak. Um, when they're talking here, one of the things I've noticed is that she basically completely changed her personality. So I think she is channeling Mr. Solis here. Doesn't give us the name, doesn't use the name, doesn't you may call me. She does, however, say, I am a noblewoman from a fallen house, which she 100% is, um, and you're under my care. 
So a way to twist and dance the words around. I really enjoyed that. All right, um, this one here, again, kind of a departure from the book series, a little bit of a change, but I really liked it. So she tells the story of Manethrin after they all sing a song. I like this a bit better than the way they did it in the books where it was she's trying to calm the villagers down. But a big Easter egg to the fans because this was a scene from before they left the Two Rivers and they kind of cobbled it in here on the road and I think it worked really well. So I liked seeing this. I wanted to include it just because I thought the song was absolutely amazing and then I thought the way that Roseman Pike talked and told the story was phenomenal too. All right, we're getting into this stuff here. This is where Perrin meets the wolves. That wolf out in front, I am 99% sure is Hopper. Hopper's pretty much the only wolf that Perrin interacts with throughout the series. Um, I mean, he does interact with some other wolves here and there, but Hopper is his go-to. And then when Hopper dies and goes into the wolf dream, uh, Perrin interacts with him completely there. So I'm really excited to see how they're going to do this. Again, most people who haven't read the books wouldn't realize that this wolf has any importance whatsoever, but my money's on that as Hopper. All right, I wanted to point this out here. So... We've talked about Trollocs and Shadow Spawn being leveled up. Um, they seem stronger, they're more brutal. Tam, an acknowledged Blade Master, who, I mean, he may be rusty, it was 20 years later, had a very hard time with one Trolloc and Rand ended up killing him. Um, Moraine had a hard time with them. Lan killed a bunch of them, of course, but he was still struggling to kill them. They were big, they were powerful, they were scary, they were mean. But they've also leveled them down just a bit. So you'll notice that all these Trollocs are carrying torches. Um, most Trollocs can see just as well in night as they can in day. They have heightened senses, heightened sense of smell, heightened sense, everything else like that. Um, I think they're showing them carrying torches here like this just because it, it looks nice. You can see them coming down the mountain holding torches. They're running through the woods holding torches and things like that. Um, yes, there were instances of Trollocs using torches in the books, um, but I think for something like this, they probably wouldn't be carrying them running through the woods, uh, but I think it was more for a visual effect than anything else, and I think they're kind of maybe leveling them down a bit because they've leveled them up in brutality and strength. Maybe this is one of the things they're taking down. Again, let me know in the comments down below if you think I'm stretching a bit there with that. I don't think I am. I think maybe this is completely on purpose, but maybe it was just for visual effect. I don't know. All right, now we're going to talk about Shader Logoth. Now, you'll notice when they first walked in, most of the warnings that Moraine gave them not to touch anything, not to do anything like that while they're in the city. We're a little bit different or didn't happen at all, but there was some foreshadowing. There was no noise. There was no birds. There was no bugs. There was no nothing. It was a dead city, completely dead. It was brought up on the way in, and then everybody kind of ignored it, especially Matt, who wandered off and grabbed the dagger, of course. But when they were all sleeping here, and uh, there you go, that's a better shot of it. Matt gets up. Now, before Matt gets up, do you remember in my episode one breakdown where I mentioned you heard Peta and Fane whistling? Yeah, you hear that exact same whistle here. So, um, I had to go back a couple of times and watch it again and again. It helps you put the subtitles on. So you put the closed captioning on. It does say whistling, whistling continues, whistling stops. Um, I'm, I, I use hearing aids personally myself. Uh, I'm really hard of hearing, uh, a lot of hearing loss. So I need subtitles on normally anyway to watch things so this was an instance where that benefited me <laughs> but that same whistling from Pat and Fane is here um so I think and, and and this this could be just me spitballing here but I think that the lack of more death is not very concerning because I think Pat and Fane is going to be labeled as basically more death and having all the powers from the get-go that's my guess, because he seemed very much more in control in, in the Two Rivers than he was in the books. Um, he did not get punished for failing his mission. As far as we know, he was not doubled up in a Trollock, Trollock cook pot and made to run with them all day. Maybe he is. Maybe we'll see that in a flashback later on. But I think he followed them here, made their way here, and he's in there, and he's the one who made Matt get the dagger to sort of release that so he could get it later on. I don't know. But at the very least, he was responsible for waking Matt up by whistling. So I want to hear your thoughts, comments, and theories on that down below in the description box because this is a big one. Um, you heard him whistle again here. Uh, I, I told you i talk about it in my episode one and my further episode breakdowns. Here it is right here. Um, I want to know why. I want to know if, if maybe the plan is to replace Mordeth with Fane without merging the two later on. Um, what do you think? 
All right. Thank you so much for sticking with me here to the very end of my Easter egg video. I had a blast giving it. I love going through this stuff. Um, and like I said in my first Easter egg video, if I missed any, and I'm sure I missed tons of them, um, I've only watched the episodes a few times at this point, let me know in the comments down below. At the end of the season, the very end, after the eighth episode on Christmas Eve, I'm going to ask you folks for all of your Easter eggs that I missed. I'm going to compile them all into one big video, and then we'll try to get a bigger picture. Because I'm sure at that point, seeing things later on in the episodes, there's probably foreshadowing I missed in episode one and two and three and four that we'll see later on. Just like reading the book series. Tons of foreshadowing in there. They're using it as well in the, in the show. And uh, until we see it a couple of times or see it run through, we're probably missing it. So... I know you folks have better eyes than me sometimes. Let me know what I missed in the comments down below. All right. Thank you so very much for sticking with me here to the very end. And here's to many more.